Hi, welcome back to Disciple Parenting. I'm Pastor Ben Martin, and I'm the Children Family Discipleship Pastor here at Pioneer Memorial Church. On this channel, we talk about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But, you know what? We've not actually paused to define what it means to be a disciple, and disciple is one of those words that it seems like everybody has their own definition. How would Jesus define a disciple, though? Well, luckily, we don't have to guess, because in John chapter 13, verse 35, he actually lays this out. You see, he's in the upper room with his disciples. He is about to head to the cross, and he is letting them know absolutely everything he can. And he said, they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. The defining characteristic of a disciple of Jesus Christ is not beliefs. It's love. So, what does that mean, and how do we raise that kind of disciple? Let's get into it. Easier said than done. Mercy. Have you ever thought about, like, how in the world you are supposed to raise children who their defining characteristic is their love? That is not easy at all. And it, it, it gets even muddier as you look at some of the other things Jesus says about love. I mean, in Luke chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus is talking about the fact that we need to love our enemies. In fact, he even goes so far to say is we should give and expect nothing in return. This is no small feat. And, and as a parent, raising kids who do this, this is scary. I mean, I think about the people who have hurt my two little boys. I don't want to tell my boys, hey, you need to love them more. You need to be around them more. No, I'm saying just stay away from them. If they're hurting you, stay away from them. And as adults, we do the same. We protect ourselves. When people hurt us, we keep our distance. But Jesus, when he's talking about loving our enemies in Matthew chapter 5, he takes it and makes it even more abundantly clear. In verse 46, he spells it out and he says, Hey guys, if you only love people who love you, if you only love people who treat you the way you want to be treated, even the tax collectors do this. There is no big surprise here. Nobody is going to be shocked by that behavior. That's not a thing. But isn't that what we all do? We love the people who love us. We like being around the people who laugh at our jokes. The people who, they like us. They like the things we say and they give us compliments and we give them compliments and everything's good. The people who invite us over to their house, we invite them over to our house. That's the way we work. That is not the love Jesus is talking about. He's talking about taking it further. He's talking about loving people who hurt us. Loving people who treat us disrespectfully. The people who cut us off. The people who don't have time for us. I mean, if we're following Jesus, of course this is what we need to do, because this is what Jesus did. Have you ever thought about the way we've treated him? And yet, instead of all of the numerous ways he could have reacted, he left his throne in heaven to come down here to earth, to be born a baby, and ultimately die on the cross. But as he's hanging there on the cross, he says those words, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Even in the midst of his suffering, he could not help but love the people who were doing this to him. As a follower of Jesus Christ, this is what we're called to. This might be why Jesus the first time he's telling his disciples about, about what's about to take place, he actually says to them, guys, deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow me. 
He has just told them he's going to die for the first time. And the next thing to come out is his invitation to take up the cross and follow him. As disciples, Jesus is tasking us with the same thing. When people have hurt us, when people have wounded us, when people have offended us, we're to love them. It's easier said than done. And this isn't to say you allow them to keep hurting you. It's not what I'm saying. You can protect yourself and still love them. What if we raise children who do this? How do you raise children who still do this? Now, first of all, if we're going to raise children who do this, we've got to model what it looks like. We can't do that on our own. It has got to be God living in us that allows us to keep loving the people who treat us bad. It's got to be Him in us. And so the next time you get a text or an email and you want to respond, I invite you, before you type a single letter, spend some time in prayer. Ask God, hey God, I want to respond this way that's not love. Can you come in to my heart? Can you create in me a new heart? Can you take the wheel on this one? Let God transform you. And here's the beautiful thing. When you start giving God this kind of ownership, when you let him live through you, people are going to notice. People are going to notice, hey, Something is going on here, but your kids are going to notice too. And they're going to say, this must be what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because the way mom or dad reacts, that's different. One more thing. I want us to just pause for a moment and imagine a church like this. A church defined not by beliefs, but by love. It's not to say our beliefs don't matter. That's not what I'm saying for an instant. I believe our beliefs lay the foundation for this love because they articulate a God who loves us beyond all reasonable belief and a call to follow him. So my challenge for you, will you give God ownership of your anger? Will you give God ownership of your pain, your hurt? And will you see what it looks like when you love the people who don't deserve it?